SummerSlam 2023 was a, a, a fine show. It was fine, wasn't it? There were some good bits and there were some bad bits. It's probably the weakest Triple H led premium live event yet, which doesn't mean it was necessarily terrible, just that the others were excellent. However, there were quite a few errors across the show that fingers crossed can be improved upon for future shows. I'm Pete Quinnell from WrestleTalk and here are the nine biggest mistakes WWE made with SummerSlam 2023. If it's your first time here, how about subscribing if you like this video and leaving us a like, it'll help us out. Plus we've got a bunch of other lists on this channel as well and daily wrestling news videos. Now let's get into it. Number one, the MMA rules match. While it's always going to be a bit of an uphill battle getting WWE fans to care about a Ronda Rousey match in 2023, the MMA rules match did its darndest to send everyone in Ford Field either to sleep or to take their collective bathroom breaks at the same time. And you know what? That is a real shame as many have long clamoured for real life BFFs Ronda and Shayna Baszler to stand opposite each other in a WWE ring. It seemed like a perfect marriage and it may well have been at least decent if they didn't make them pretend to actually fight each other. While pro wrestling in general could fall under that description, you very rarely see people busting out Canadian destroyers during your average Saturday night scrap outside the pub, do you? So yeah, there's a suspension of disbelief in normal pro wrestling, something that is extremely hard to have when watching two legit MMA fighters pretend to do the thing they did for real for many years. Worked MMA does nothing but make WWE look really corny and way faker than any tope suicida ever could. Shayna and Rousey's pre-match hype packages showed the potential this match could have had, with Baszler in particular showing genuine believable emotion that deserved a better end result when the two faced. If WWE were that intent on going the real fighting route, how about a fight pit or something along those lines that at least would have had the slight chance to work? WWE reportedly didn't even know what MMA rules was even going to be just days prior to the match happening and that says it all really. Number two, a long show. Speaking of things that shouldn't have happened, why after a year of three to three and a half hour PLEs on the Triple H was SummerSlam allowed to go as long as four hours? hours 15 minutes. Even worse was when you add up the actual total match lengths obtained via cagematch.net, you get about two hours, 23 minutes, which is like nearly two hours of not wrestling. How is that even possible? Especially when matches such as Becky Lynch versus Trish Stratus were cut due to time constraints. But it's a big four, right? You might be saying it needs all the gravitas, those long entrances, sponsorship plugs. Well, sure. But when those things take up almost as much time as your wrestling, you've got a real problem. I sincerely hope that Triple H can cut this back down as long shows did unfortunately become a real hallmark of the Vince era towards the end. WrestleMania 34 and 35 surpassed that five hour mark, so we're not quite there yet, but it is a dangerous trend. There is one particularly egregious offender of this though, one that took up a whole 22% of the entire show's runtime. That of course being number three, a long main event. Yes, while some other matches on the card did drag on at times, nothing remotely comes close to the 57 minutes minutes 43 seconds of Roman Reigns versus Jey Uso in tribal combat. While the main event segment came just shy of the hour mark, what made this particularly noteworthy was only 36 of those near 58 minutes were the actual match. That's just shy of 22 minutes of presentation that wasn't wrestling. The video package, the extremely needlessly long entrances were as long as every other match bell to bell on the card. When you also factor in that a great chunk of the actual 36 minutes of in-ring action was either stare downs, slow Roman offense, or solo interference, then there's really not much forgiving this one. Once again, when you factor in the decision to cut at least one women's match, potentially two, if reports are to be believed, from the card in order to fit all this stuff in, then no bloody wonder you have an upset female locker room trips. We've been absolutely spoiled by the bloodline in so many ways, including typically excellent main event matches. Ones that, yes, can be quite long and plodding at points, but ultimately always see the people on their feet by the end. But this one, it was just kind of a chore, and the ultimate payoff for the 57 minutes 43 seconds of pain did little to make any of it seem worthwhile. Quite the opposite, in fact. Number four, Jimmy Uso's heel turn. Now, the conclusion to Tribal Combat has and will divide opinion. Some, including Jimmy and Jay, apparently want this brother versus brother feud, and it may end up being an extra tasty layer to the bloodline cake. Also, worth noting, this was written and presented prior to SmackDown, so if Jimmy comes out on SmackDown and pours his heart out and justifies all the ways that Jay had it coming, then I will freely admit my errors and eat my hat. Metaphorically, that is. I won't actually eat my hat. However, no matter how Jimmy spins it, it's hard to imagine why he would do what he did at SummerSlam. For one, it was literally just a couple of months ago that Jimmy saved Jay from Roman's mental torture, getting both of them free from the bloodline shackles. And secondly, Jimmy literally just spent a kayfabe month in the hospital following a beatdown from Roman and Solo, with Jay 
swearing revenge on his behalf at SummerSlam. I don't care how jealous he may be, it's just a real stretch, especially when so much has been made out of Jimmy and Jay's unbreakable bond, never cracking once in nearly 15 years as a team in WWE. If there were clues and foreshadowing along the way, sure, but clearly, given the unanimous question of WTF, WWE didn't do a good enough job with that. Number five, interference in tribal combat. So aside from the ill-advised finish and torturous length, what was the next biggest cardinal thing that tribal combat enacted? Well, WWE did that thing where they made up a new stipulation, literally their own rules, they could have made them say whatever they wanted, and then they went and broke those rules that they made up. So while it wasn't made abundantly clear on TV on WWE's website, one of Tribal Combat's rules was no outside interference. So why did they go on to have the exact opposite happen? Again, WWE made this rule. They put it in black and white. Why make the rule a thing in the first place? It's a Roman match after all. We all knew there'd be interference. It was a given. So why bother? So one must now question, will Roman be punished by the elders for this violation of the rules? That would be neat and make all this, I guess, make some sense, but given the fact that nobody on commentary mentioned this once during the match, there will likely be no repercussions. This is just a classic case of WWE making their own rulebook and not following it and just expecting people not to notice their incompetence. Number six, Logan Paul and Ricochet's expectations. Hyped up to be the most viral match of all time, ad nauseum by WWE, Logan and Ricochet, there was a lot of viral. That is, until the bell rang and the action was only moderately viral at best. Yes, despite Logan and Trevor putting on a very good match and providing another case of Logan being way better than he ever should be, it just wasn't very viral, was it? Sure, there were some very memorable spots, Logan's buckshot lariat to the outside, his seamless springboard frog splash, his incredibly satisfying tornado DDT, but nothing really close to the jaw-dropping nature of that Royal Rumble moment between the two. I'm not sure what they could have pulled off to top that in all honesty, so I question why the word viral was tossed around so much. This was arguably the the least viral of all his matches thus far, aside from his debut, but that takes nothing away from both men's efforts. The obsession with a particular phrase or slogan for a match is something WWE are known to be guilty of. Greatest wrestling match of all time, anybody? And yeah, they, they pretty much never deliver on the billing, so maybe just stop doing that. Number seven, sponsorship integration. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Yet another big four PLE, yet another boatload of sponsorship integration all over the show. While nothing at SummerSlam may have topped the egregiousness of the Mountain Dew Pitch Black match or the Dancing Cinnamon Toast Crunch emoji mascot at ringside during the blood feud between father and son Ray and Dominic Mysterio, SummerSlam did come close. Some were fine and not overly offensive, like the Alpha Academy's Mike Harder's Lemonade plug. The Slim Jim stuff with LA Knight and Bianca Belair, pretty sweet actually, and a nice callback to the Macho Man's famous back in the day. But C4 Energy, get in the bin, mate. Now, having C4 plastered all over the ring, that the logo that is, not the explosive, it's passable. But having Bianca Belair enter the triple threat women's title match last instead of the champion, Asuka, just so she can show off the C4 can on her entrance is gross. I get it. These deals are not going anywhere. They make WWE a ton of extra dollar, and that's fine. I don't have an issue with sponsorships. I have an issue with poorly integrated sponsorships that detract from the product you're watching instead of adding to it. Stop it. Stop doing that, WWE. Number eight, Finn Balor not winning. In what was potentially the match of the night, Finn Balor looked to put seven years of hurt behind him and begin that world title reign that he never properly got. Everything seemed perfectly teed up for Finn to take home his second ever world title, the revenge arc, the potential for outside interference with the judgment day, the opportunity to pull a swerve with a cash-in tease from Priest. There were so many outside factors that would have allowed Seth to take the loss without much damage, while also allowing for for some excellent future storyline possibilities for the Judgment Day. And importantly, giving Finn what he deserves, damn it. Maybe it's perhaps too early in Seth's run to take the belt off him, but are any of Seth's current prospects as champion as tantalizing as the one we would have got if Finn took the W? Realistically, they could have rode this out for a whole lot longer to see Finn start off on top of the world only to gradually feel the threat of Priest in the briefcase breathing down his neck. It would have been excellent. You could have really told a great story of paranoia, maybe one that would have led to Finn turning on Priest before he could do the same to him. Instead, the group seems set for a premature split and Rollins is already seemingly moving on to different things. It's truly a, a wasted opportunity. Granted, it was still a great match and the story with the Judgment Day was still furthered, but it just felt like Balor winning could have potentially opened up some more interesting avenues for stories, while this one felt a little underwhelming. And number nine, Super Bianca continues. After over a year of domination as Raw Women's Champion, it truly was a nice change of pace to see Bianca Belair taken down a peg at Night of Champions when she lost 
lost her title to Asuka. Fans were long tired of Belair's superhero ways of overcoming adversity again and again to retain her title. So the prospect of Belair maybe going through a cold streak, forcing her to embrace an edgier side was an exciting one. And you know what? It was real nice while it lasted, because at SummerSlam, peak Super Bianca was back and way more superer than before. Overcoming a kayfabe knee injury, Charlotte's figure eight, Asuka, and the Partridge in a Pear Tree to win the belt is just a little absurd, though thankfully she was brought back down to the land of mere mortals by Io Sky's cash-in afterwards. The absurdity of the finish was peak Bianca wins lol, putting even 2007 John Cena to shame. After initially being hopeful that WWE had learned from the boos that were solely encroaching on Belair towards the end of her run, I feel that they may have already forgotten and we could be set for another reign of dominance in the near future. Heck, she got used to beating Io, Bailey, and Dakota at the same time on a regular basis last year. What chance does Io have herself? I guess you better get to drinking that C4 energy, Io. It's the only chance you've got. And that's our list. Did I miss anything out? Let me know in the comments and subscribe if it's your first time here and like the video. If you want some other really fun content, check out this episode of Three Count, where Ollie and Luke have to review every single SummerSlam there's ever been, except for this one because it was recorded before SummerSlam 2023, in three words or less. Two, three! Count one today, we're going to be reviewing every single SummerSlam that's ever happened in three words or fewer. Can they coexist? Can they coexist? Yeah, where's the yeah, tagline? Yeah, where's yeah, yeah. What a start! Perfect title conclusion. I'm doing You're reading mine. I'm reading yours. <laughs>